Welcome to WordPath, a new show about the preservation and the importance of Oklahoma Indian languages. Uh, let me say a few words about our opening sequence, first of all, that we just showed you. Um, the idea is that we're going to be going all around the state of Oklahoma to the four corners of the state, talking to people who are teaching languages and preserving languages in different areas and in different tribes. The music was by Ketches Shano. It's called Thunder Skies. And I picked that out because of its interesting combination of the traditional Indian flute with modern sounds as well. Um, let's make a couple of terms clear. First of all, the, I've used the word Indian. Some people prefer Native American. I tend to use both. Um, my practice in these matters is generally to follow the usage of the people I'm talking to or about. And every Native American person I know in Oklahoma calls themselves uh, Indian, at least some of the time. So I'll use both terms. Um, please no one take offense if they prefer Native American. Indian is so much shorter, for one thing. Um, it's interesting, this term India, Indian, as it relates to Indian languages, um, in a lot of the different communities around the state, people grew up saying, I talk Indian, the other people talk English, I talk Indian. Um, and in various different corners of the state, that Indian phrase meant something different depending on what tribe was local there. But it has sort of reinforced the common notion that Indian languages are all the same, which they certainly are not. There are a couple of dozen distinct Indian or Native American languages spoken in Oklahoma today. So talking Indian is not just one thing. It's a variety of different kinds of things. Um, the show is about language preservation. And there are two senses in which we could talk about preservation. You can preserve a language the way you preserve cucumbers by pickling them and putting them on a shelf. Now, when it comes to languages, that would mean tape recording them or making videotapes or writing things down and putting them in books and putting them on a shelf. And this is important work. But I'm going to concentrate in this show on the other kind of preservation, which I call dynamic language preservation. In other words, trying to preserve a language as a living, breathing organism. Um, a Latin is an example of a language which is basically dead, even though it's been preserved in the archival sense. It's sort of been pickled like a cucumber. Uh, but it would be awfully hard to bring it back and make it into a cucumber again. So the efforts that are going on today with Indian languages in Oklahoma are aimed, uh, as a first priority, they're aimed at preserving in the dynamic sense so that the languages will be living languages and children will grow up speaking them for generations to come. Oklahoma is an especially good place um, to learn about Indian languages and to study a variety of Indian languages because there are more Indians in this state than in any other state in the Union as of the last census in 1990. Um, my work as a linguist um, has revealed to me the tremendous linguistic riches of our state and the urgent need to work for language preservation in Native American communities. Let me give you just a little bit of history for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with the overall situation with languages and cultures and European versus Indian ways. At the time of the European invasion, begun several centuries ago, uh, there was, of course, a certain amount of outright slaughter of Indian people. So there went their languages. There was also a different kind of language loss because of the cultural pressures that came to bear with European languages and cultures uh, becoming more predominant. Um, there was a lot of pressure for the languages not to be used anymore. And this affected the languages in various ways. For one thing, uh, some people simply stopped speaking their languages. Uh, there are very few communities where there has been an outright stoppage of speaking them, but that has happened with individuals, certainly. Another thing that people have done is that they've borrowed words from English or French or Spanish into their language to, to name things that they weren't familiar with before the invasion. Um, so there are all sorts of effects on Indian languages just because of the juxtaposition of these two different cultural types. But in addition, of course, there was the whole boarding school era and the land allotment where Indian land was um, assigned in among speakers of other languages quite deliberately in an effort to eradicate the languages and the cultures. And of course, this had a very strong effect on the survival of languages and cultures. And after many decades of all of this, in addition to all of our uh, pressure of modern media, the fact that radio and television and popular music and public education and all of these things are pretty much in English in the state, because of all of these pressures, we've come to a point where uh, Indian languages are dying out. Uh, if, if there aren't drastic measures taken quickly, it's only a question of time before all of the languages uh, that are indigenous to this state, uh, the, the non-European languages, will be dying out. Uh, so these days, a lot of Indian children are saying, are waking up to this. Young people are waking up to this um, set of facts. And they're saying, we need to learn our traditional 
languages or languages of heritage now before it's too late. Um, unfortunately, things have come to such a state that the parents of the current younger generation are in many cases not in a position to teach the languages because they didn't ever attain fluency themselves. Um, so the result is that a lot of thought has to be put into saving these languages quickly and you have to be very creative. You have to get the elders involved with the very young. Um, and that's what this program will be all about. We'll talk to different people who are involved in the process of teaching and learning Indian languages and preserving them in other ways as well and ask them why it's important to them to do, to do this and how they go about it, what kind of methods work for them, what kind of classroom they work in. And uh, we'll go into classrooms. We'll take our cameras out around the state, traveling in the little car around to the four corners. Um, and we'll see classes in action, and we'll see elders teaching their language. And we'll talk to them about why it's important and how it ties in with their cultural values and so forth. Um, let's talk a little bit more about demographics. In the world today, there are some 6,000 languages spoken. Uh, it's really hard to pin it down with the precision, but something like 6,000 languages in the world. And of these, it's been estimated by Michael Krauss at the University of Alaska, who's made quite an extensive study of this. He estimates that 50% of those languages will become extinct within a century. That means that this, the state of affairs for languages in the world, not only in this country or state, but in the world, is uh, very serious. It's far more serious than the threat to biological species. Um, it's thought that something like 7% or so of mammals are threatened or endangered within the century. Uh, compared that to 50% of human languages. Um, let me give you some statistics in particular about Oklahoma Indian languages. In each case, I'll mention the language name, tell you a, an estimate of how many speakers are left, and that at the rate things are going, an estimate of how many years the language may be able to survive. Arapaho, 100 speakers, 40 years. Caddo, 35 speakers, 20 years. <coughs> Cherokee, 9,000 speakers out of 11,000 total in the country, maybe 70 years. Cheyenne, 400 speakers out of 2,000 total, 40 years. Chickasaw, 1,000 speakers, 40 years. Chiricahua Apache, three speakers, 50 total in the country, 10 years. Choctaw, 4,000 speakers out of 8,000 total in the country, 70 years. Comanche, 160 speakers, 40 years. Delaware, or Lenny Lenap, two speakers, perhaps 10 in the country, 10 years. Iowa, or Iowa, 30 speakers, 10 years. Kanza or Ka, two speakers, 10 years. Kickapoo, 100 speakers, 700 total in North America, 40 years. Kiowa, 400 speakers, 40 years. Muskogee, uh, also known as Creek, Creek and Seminole together, 5,000 speakers, 70 years. Osage, five speakers, 10 years. Oto, 30 speakers, 10 years. Pawnee, 50 speakers, 20 years. Plains Apache, five speakers, 10 years. Ponca, 30 speakers, 10 years. Potawatomi, 20 speakers, 100 total in the country, 10 years. Sac and Fox, or Meskwaki, 30 speakers, 10 years. Seneca and Cayuga, 50 speakers, 200 total in the country, 10 years. Shawnee, 200 speakers, 40 years. Wichita, 12 speakers, 20 years. And Yuchi, 50 speakers, 20 years. Obviously, the need is very great for a special effort immediately if these languages are to be saved. <clears throat> Fortunately, an effort is being made by people all over Oklahoma. This show will feature and honor those people who are working to save their languages. Here's some examples. There are university classes being offered at OU through the Anthropology Department and Native American Studies, also at Northeastern State in Tahlequah and at Tulsa University. There are junior college classes, or there have been, uh, for instance, classes in Chickasaw at Murray State and in Comanche at the Great Plains Votech in Lawton. There are community classes in many of the Native American communities. Uh, 
Kiowa classes have been held for many years, Comanche, Creek, many others, just organized by people who know the languages or, or recruit a teacher that's fluent in the language, and they'll meet in living rooms or community rooms or libraries or schools after hours or whatever. There are a few public school classes. Cherokee is notable in this regard. They've had elementary school classes for a while now. Um, there are hymn singing groups, such as a Comanche group that I know of that meets out uh, west of Lawton. There are classes being held at tribal complexes, uh, for instance, at the Ponca Tribal Complex south of Ponca City and at the uh, Comanche Tribal Complex just east of Lawton, there have been classes. There are immersion activities from time to time. For instance, the Comanche Tribe held an immersion, uh, a language immersion weekend, which means that for the weekend of activities, the participants were asked not to speak any English, to speak only Comanche, even if they didn't know any Comanche yet. They had to, sc to scrab scramble with their teachers to uh, do, do the best that they could. And there have been high school classes in at least one language that I know of, which is Oto. This was up at uh, Red Rock, <clears throat> north of Stillwater. There have been, or will be, preschools uh, conducted entirely in Indian languages. Uh, a Comanche preschool is about to begin next month, which will be held out in cash. Uh, there, have been, there has been preschool instruction in the Head Start program at the Caddo Tribe, and I'm sure there have been other programs. Um, there's a study group that will be meeting this coming semester at Oklahoma State University um, to prepare classroom teaching materials for the Oto language. And there are language committees and study groups in various tribes which are going about the business of trying to adopt official alphabets, um, make official plans, and have an organized attack on the problem. And in addition to all of this, there's independent study by Indian and non-Indian scholars, including some uh, people who are professional linguists like myself, and also just people who are uh, feeling the need to get in touch with their heritage. Um, and they take it upon themselves to write uh, grammar books and dictionaries, uh, to keep up word files, and to record the old stories and songs and so forth. So we'll have shows that emphasize all of these different settings. We'll try to have examples of each one on the show in the coming year. And also on the role of linguistics in all of this effort, there is some uh, some people are interested in having professional advice from linguists who are trained uh, in the scientific approach to language and language teaching. We'll have probably a show about how children learn language because this is very important in planning language classes and on various methods of teaching Indian languages and of learning Indian languages. I tell the teachers that not only the teachers need to know what they're doing but there are things that the students of languages can do to improve their efforts and get a better return on their time that they put in. Um, and we'll also see what kind of opportunities there are in the state of Oklahoma to study and learn Indian languages. Who's holding classes where? And what, what do you need to do to sign up? So the situation is extremely urgent. Uh, there are many factors involved. Time is the primary one. Time is just running out. Uh, speakers of these very rare languages are dying every day. Let's, let's face it, it's very sad but true. Um, so time is the number one factor. But in addition, there are other very urgent needs because of the time uh, and because of the lack of a tradition of studying Indian languages for the most part in an organized way. There needs to be cur curriculum development worked out. Many people are working on this in different tribes today. Classroom materials need to be created uh, uh, as they will be doing up at Oklahoma State for Oto and other tribes and uh, classes are working on this too. Um, alphabets need to be developed in some cases. Uh, in some tribes more than one alphabet has been used and standardization is being sought so that materials can be written and read all in one alphabet. Uh, teaching methods are being developed. Um, a lot of Indian people uh, feel frustrated when they have trouble learning a language. They think, well, I'm Comanche. I ought to speak Comanche better than I do. Or how come I can't learn it better? I mean, it's my language. But in fact, uh, you need teaching methodology and you need learning methodology in order to become effective in these efforts. And finally, and this is the, really the second biggest factor after time, money is needed because it's very expensive to run preschools or public school classes or to print books or to develop materials. Um, even the tape recording and videotaping of things for archival preservation is very expensive. So money needs to be found. Tribes are looking to each other, to professional linguists, to professional language teachers, to their own elders for help in organizing themselves to make the best attack on this problem. Our guests will be telling you in the coming weeks why this work is so important to them. No one has said it better um, than a Delaware woman who I heard speak at a conference a few years back. 
She stood up, we were talking about language preservation and why it was important, and she said, it's very simple for me. I have to learn my language because when it's my time to die and my ancestors come for me, they're only gonna speak Delaware, they don't understand English. Um, I was very touched by that comment and I think it kind of sums it up for a lot of Indian people, why it's important to them. I hope the show will be educational for both Indians and non-Indians in Oklahoma. Uh, but it's not just a how-to manual, it's also kind of a human interest story. We'll, in talking to teachers, we'll talk to people who have a lot of years on them, a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom about the world, and they have very, very interesting stories to tell. Um, we'll find out, we'll look, in the process of uh, talking to the teachers and looking at the languages, we'll find out of some of the interesting differences between these Indian languages and English, and some of the differences among uh, the different Indian languages. Um, just to throw out a few interesting uh, differences, in Cherokee one word suffices to, as the word for table and for chair, there's no distinction made between those two, something different from English. In Comanche, um, there's a, an expression which always makes our beginning Comanche students um, chuckle in order to say um, a white person, in Comanche you say taivo, um, a black person is a tu taivo, that's a black taivo, um, a Chinese person is a kuexi taiwo. Kuexi is that braid of hair that uh, people think of Asian people as wearing. Um, and finally, a quasi taiwo or a tail taiwo is the translation for a monkey. <laughs> Little joke on white people there. Another interesting fact, in Ponca, the word for man, nu, happens to be pronounced the same as the word for potato, which gives rise to some interesting jokes among Ponca friends of mine. And of course, there are many uh, differences that linguists pay a lot of attention to, grammatical differences among languages. For instance, in English, we have postpositions like in and for and from. In Comanche, instead of, prep, I'm sorry, in English, we have prepositions, which come before the noun. In Comanche, we have just the opposite, what's called postpositions. So you say something like table on as opposed to on the table. Um, another interesting fact that comes into the sort of grammatical and structural realm in Ponca women and men talk slightly differently and if you need if you want to speak fluent and appropriate Ponca you need to speak like a man if you're a man and like a woman if you're a woman the Kiowa language is interesting for its great variety of what most people find to be very difficult sounds it in, including the fact that it has tones uh, somewhat uh, as many Asian languages do so the pitch of your voice is very in, is very important in Kiowa uh, let's see, in Choctaw, there are two entirely separate uh, sets of pronouns which can both be used to express subjects, and you have to learn which set to use when. But while we are interested in all of these differences among languages, let's please keep in mind that, um, yeah, that these are not uh, so-called primitive or backwards languages. It breaks my heart when a Comanche student comes to class at OU and says, uh, Gee, the word order is funny. I guess we Comanches talk backwards, huh? I say, oh yeah, maybe we English speakers talk backwards. Uh, so languages are different, and linguists uh, and people who respect cultural differences don't try to say that one language is better than another or more advanced than another or more primitive than another. Languages are simply different, and I think their, their, their differences are very interesting. So we'll glimp have glimpses into all of this, what the languages are like, what the teachers are like, what the teaching methodology is like, and so forth. Um, Let me mention just briefly a few organizations for those of you who may be interested in getting more involved in this. Uh, there are several organizations that are important in language preservation, especially as relates to uh, Native American languages. Um, one is an organization called NALI, N-A-L-I, which is an acronym for Native American Language Issues Institute. Their headquarters is near Oklahoma City, and it's a, an organization uh, mostly of Indian people who are involved in teaching and learning and preserving their languages. There's another one called SILA, S-S-I-L-A, is the acronym on that one. And that stands for the Society for the Study of the Indigenous Languages of the Americas. Um, if you would like uh, mailing addresses and so forth on any of these organizations, please get in touch with the program. There's a post office box at the end so that we can get you more information on these. Um, there are also um, email lists on the uh, electronic uh, computer networks that relate specifically to Native American languages. And of course, tribal governments have their own network uh, where they communicate with each other about their efforts and what works and what doesn't work for them. Let me mention a few books as well. I brought a selection on the table here for the set. 
Uh, we certainly won't go through all of these, but one that I find most interesting to my approach to language preservation, whoops, is this one called Flutes of Fire. Um, the author is Leanne Hinton, and it's a book of essays on language preservation in the state of California. So it doesn't relate directly to Oklahoma Indian languages, and yet there is so much in here which would be uh, applicable to preservation in the state. Um, she talks about all sorts of different approaches, uh, formal classes, master apprentice programs where an elder fluent speaker is matched with a younger person who wants to learn the language and they're given a salary so that they can put a large amount of their time into the job of teaching and learning the language. Uh, this is one method that's been used in California that I hope some Oklahomans will be able to use. A very expensive method, but very effective. Um, of course, tape recording and analytical study and a lot of other things are addressed in here, too. Um, let me see what else. Uh, there are a number of Indian languages offered, uh, as I said before, at University of Oklahoma, so um, that's pretty close at hand here in Norman. Um, languages that have been taught include Choctaw, Cherokee, Crete, Comanche, and Kiowa. They also taught uh, Lakota for some time, but the others are the Oklahoma languages that have been taught. Um, and some of those classes, if you get in touch with the Anthropology or Native American Studies uh, at OU, some of those classes may have workbooks that they've worked up or even dictionaries and other teaching materials that in some cases have been uh, made available to tribal members or to the general public. So get in touch with people there if you're interested in that kind of materials. Um, there are also many uh, specific books that have been published on Oklahoma languages. Uh, this is, um, I hope I don't cause a great avalanche here. This is a well-known uh, dictionary of Cherokee um, by Durbin Feeling, a Cherokee linguist. He's Cherokee linguist in both senses. Um, that is, he's a Cherokee man himself, um, and he studies the Cherokee language. Um, oh, I have a, a small selection of other things here, an introduction to Choctaw, about the Choctaw language. Um, we have a grammar book of Cherokee that's pretty well known by Holmes and Smith. Um, a dictionary was recently published on Ottawa. Let me get my thing set down here. Here's the Ottawa Dictionary. Ottawa English and English Ottawa by um, Chief Charles Dawes of the Ottawa Tribe. And what else? We have a pretty well-known grammar of the Kiowa language by Laurel Watkins. I believe this originated as a PhD dissertation in linguistics. And a number of other things. This is a very interesting book that came out just a year or so ago, I believe, on Southern Cheyenne women's songs. It addresses the language to some degree, but only by way of explicating the songs and showing what their, the structure of the words to the songs are. This is published by OU Press by Virginia Giglio. And, well, there are various other books. We'll get into the details of some of the other languages and some of the other materials um, that are available as we go along. But I think um, a theme that will come uh, again and again that will uh, be mentioned on this program is the relationship between language and culture. I've talked a little bit about stories and songs. Obviously, if there's an old story told, say, in Caddo, um, and that was never popularized in English, then when the older people who knew those stories, uh, who knew that story in Caddo, um, pass away and no one is left to speak Caddo, then no one's going to be able to tell those stories again. I mean, this is sort of obvious. You might think, well, we can do these things in translation, but I think um, not only Indian people in this country, but um, uh, people who speak minority languages all over the world feel very strongly that the language and the culture are so closely related that a translation really, uh, it's not the same thing as, as being able to understand the original in the original language. And they feel that something is lost when the story is translated into, say, English or some other dominant language. Um, of course, you also lose the sound of the words, the poetry of the words, and so forth. And speaking of poetry, poetry and song are very closely related um, uh, genres. Uh, there is an enormous literature of Native American songs. Each tribe has its own specific songs. Um, I've been working recently with a, a project to document the turkey dance among the Caddo. 
Um, and the turkey dance songs, it's interesting. So many people, so many Caddo, Caddo people have been singing the turkey dance songs for generations. But in recent generations, with very few people speaking the Caddo language anymore, it was a matter of sort of memorizing the songs by rote. So people knew what syllables to sing, but um, they didn't really know what they were singing about. Now, the turkey dance, for those of you who haven't seen it, is, is a primarily a woman's dance. The women dance in special long floor-length dresses with aprons, and they wear a special dashtu ornament in their hair made out of silver with a ribbon that goes all the way down to the ground. It's beautiful. People think of it as a very womanly, very feminine thing. And when we had Caddo classes out uh, in Gracemont a couple of years ago and started writing down some of the turkey dance songs as the elders sang them to us, we tape recorded them and wrote them down, we started working on translations to figure out exactly what the words were saying. Uh, some people weren't sure if there were words to the songs or not, and some of the turkey dance songs don't have real words, it's more vocables. Um, but some of them have words, and by golly, it turns out that they are very violent words telling uh, the history of violent confrontations, and they're basically victory songs talking about vicious battles that have taken place. And so as the ladies dance around with their dashtus and their long skirts, um, they're singing about uh, beating up the Comanche with a rock, and the, wolf, the wolves are eating that Osage who's lying out there on the plain after we got him, and all sorts of very graphic, violent things like this. And there's a lot of history in these songs, and it's the kind of thing that you really can't appreciate unless you understand the language. You can't fully appreciate it. So language and culture are very intimately related, and we'll be hearing this again and again from people who teach both their language and their culture. Um, as we go along, uh, since I am not Indian myself, and even if I were, I wouldn't be a member of every tribe, I'm going to be uh, interviewing these people and trying to give them a voice and let them say what's important to them. Um, you know, but I will not be of their tribe. Um, so it's very important to me, especially for that reason, that our viewers um, get in touch with me if they have any feedback, if they feel anything inappropriate has been said, or that questions were not asked that should have been, or vice versa. Or if you have suggestions for future guests, uh, if there's someone you know who's actively uh, on the word path, fighting for their Indian languages, we'd like to hear about them and see if they'd like to be on the show. If they are too elderly to come to see us in the studio, or if it's too far away, we can go to them with our remote cameras and we can go see them in their classrooms or in their homes or whatever. So this show honors the heroes of Oklahoma Indian language preservation, the teachers who continue on the word path, fighting for their languages. They don't do it for the high pay or short hours. They do it because they believe in it. And so do I. To all you teachers working so hard on the word path, you are cedars on the hill at sunrise. We salute you and we honor you. See you next time on the word path.